at least now we go. Welcome everyone to our seminar today. We have a seminar about radio astronomy and the Galactic Center. Uh, Isabella Ramala from South Africa will give the talk today. She is a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn. Uh, in fact, she works with Michael Kramer, who is one of the directors there and who's very much interested in pulsars at the Galactic Center, in fact, as Isabella is. So uh, Isabella has done her Master of Science at uh, Rhodes University and uh, actually in parallel at Oxford University as well, where she has been frequently doing her Master's and PhD, at least virtually because of COVID, because we have just commented that, that, that it was difficult times. Um, she got her PhD in uh, physics at Rhodes University in 2022. And this is what uh, this talk will be about. Uh, Isabella is, has worked on meerkat data of the galactic center. I'm sure most of you have seen these absolutely stunning images that we found from the galactic center. She's visiting our galactic center group this week to discuss point sources, to uh, discuss synergies, what we can do with the infrared, etc. cetera. And uh, Isabella has uh, created the largest point source catalog at the Galactic Center so far. So um, yeah, we'll be happy to hear your talk. This is all yours now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to give you a talk as Raina already mentioned about um, the Galactic Center work that I did with Meerkat um, during my PhD. And I'm going to start first. Um, over, a little over five years ago, Meerkat uh, was inaugurated. And during its commissioning phase, in that last months before it was inaugurated, we were observing the Galactic Center. And at the time, um, this image was produced. This is the first image of the Galactic Center uh, with Meerkat 64 antennas. Um, but also this image uh, includes data from the uh, single dish. I think it was the GBT that, we, that was used uh, for the um, short baselines. And it was in this time that we realized that there's a lot of work that we can do with this data. And um, before I can get into that, uh, already we already know that the Galactic Center is a very complex region. Um, compared to the galactic plane, there's a very high concentration of molecular gases. And I'm just pointing a few uh, regions of molecular gas in the Galactic Center here. There's orders of magnitude in the Galactic Center higher than in the galactic plane. Um, there's also very um, complex, strong, complex magnetic fields. Um, as I pointed there with these non-thermal radio filaments, we currently do not yet understand what are the sources of these filaments, but we, there are some clues that are coming out from previous work, including um, works that comes from this data set. Um, and also there is a high concentration of stellar mass uh, um, of of clusters of stars, high mass stars in this region. And because of that, um, we have an interest in searching for pulsars in the galactic center. I'm showing you the few uh, of the supernova remnants that are visible in this image. And from here on, this talk is going to focus mostly on the search for radio pulses in the galactic center. And to understand why we expect pulses in the galactic center, uh, we start first by looking at the stellar evolution, uh, the life cycles of stars. Our focus is going to be on the very massive stars in this region. Massive stars, um, they will evolve into super Red, red supergiants and then go into a supernova when they run out of fuel. And when they're very massive, they can either depend on the mass, become a black hole or a neutron star. And our focus is going to be on these searching for neutron stars or black holes in the galactic center, stellar mass black holes in the galactic center. 
Um, when the neutron star, when 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 the mass of a star is big enough to be a neutron star, but not too big to be a black hole, sometimes that neutron star can have radio emissions that are beamed in our line of sight. And with every rotation, um, you detect the pulse of radio emission that we call a pulsar. To understand that, I'm going to first show you this um, model of how we explain radio emission from a pulsar. We start with this uh, toy model where in the neutron star is pretty much uh, regarded as a giant dipolar magnet. Ma magnet. This magnet is um, misaligned from the rotation axis. It's rotating very fast and the, the magnetic fields are rotating along with the giant magnet, the neutron star. And at some point, um, at some distance from from the, the neutron star, the magnetic fields uh, will now have to either rotate at the speed of light, which is impossible. And in that case, uh, we have this thing called the light cylinder where the, um, the magnetic fields, instead of being closed, they remain open. And this is where the radio emission um, is beamed. We don't know exactly the emission physics that goes into uh, how radio emission is emitted from this uh, neutron stars, but we can use this model to try to um, derive some properties of the pulsar or the neutron star by just assuming a dipolar magnet and we, from getting the, the magnetic moment, um, we can derive the radiative energy and from there, the characteristic age and mostly pulsars or pulsars, the radio pulsars turn to be fast rotators. They rotate really fast and they can go up to like the fastest we know rotates 716 seconds, uh, 716 times uh, in a second. And they tend to be very stable. The very fast rotating neutron star that we call uh, millisecond pulsars they turn to be very stable and therefore their period and period derivative of spin down period tends to be stable to a thousands or millions of years. And it is that property that makes them very um, accurate clocks. And so with the, with the neutron star, as it rotates with every rotation, we're able to detect a pulse and that pulse, the time of arrival of this pulse uh, for the very stable pulsars can be uh, determined um, very accurately. And that makes pulsars uh, very strong, clock, um, accurate clocks that we can use for fundamental physics. So in the galactic center, when we, 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 if we can, when we discover pulsars in the galactic center, we can use them as tools. Uh, for example, we can use them um, to study the line of sight interstellar medium or the turbulent interstellar medium and the electron density in the inner uh, region of the galactic center. And I've learned yesterday that um, the, the initial mass function uh, in the galactic center is, uh, is different from that of the galactic plane. And if we can find radio pulsars in the galactic center. We can, their numbers and their age can be used to infer the initial mass function and the overall, and study the overall stellar evolution in the galactic center. Moreover, because we have a high um, density of massive stars in the galactic center, we can, we, we have a high probability of finding uh, pulsars and uh, stellar mass black holes and most likely because they're very close, uh, dense, we are most likely to also find pulsar and a neutron star binary system, a uh, pulsar and a black hole binary system, which is a system that's never been discovered before. And that is why we look into the galactic center for um, to search for pulsars. But the problem comes when we have been searching for a very long time, but there's only about five pulsars and the magnetar there in the center within about a square degree 
of Sagittarius A. So the question comes, where are all the pulsars in the galactic center? Because you say you expect them, but where are they? I went through my PhD trying to figure out what could be the reason for not us for us not finding pulsars. And there's about three um, reasons that were compelling to me, two of which I will actually just leave here and ask, because I'm not an expert in this case. Uh, the first one is based on the, the propagation effect of the way that we search for pulsars. That may be a limitation to the reason why we're not finding any pulses, and I'll explain on that a little bit more shortly. But there's also other two reasons or compelling theories that I actually would love for us to discuss this, um, if anybody knows anything regarding this, is that the star formation event that has, ha that has happened in the galactic center is too recent for uh, pulses to have been, uh, for the stars to have evolved to become pulses. And the other one is that the population of galactic center, uh, there may be a new population of um, galactic center sources, radio sources, that somewhat share similar prob uh, properties with pulsars, but they lack pulsation, and that's why we're not seeing the pulsation. Um, but I'm only going to focus on the first one, and I'll leave these two uh, as a point of discussion if that's any of interest of any of you. Um, my first focus is going to be on the propagation effects, looking first at the dispersive delay. So um, when, when a pulsar emits uh, radio emission, the pulse radio emission, um, they interact with the interstellar medium. And we know in the galactic center that there is a high density of free electrons, ionized electrons, that will um, delay uh, the group velocity of the radio emission. And in the high frequency, they turn when 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 we detect them across the broadband channels, the high frequencies turn to arrive earlier than the lower frequency, and that dispersive delay is defined by an equation that I showed you there, which which um, directly relates to the amount of electron content density in the line of sight between you, uh, the observer, and the pulsar. And that um, integrated electron content density along the line of sight is what we call a, a, is a, is a, is a factor that we call a dispersion measure. And if one knows the dispersion measure, they can use that factor to realign the, the pulses across the broadband. And then we average. So it is the average pulse profile that is shown in the corrective for dispersion pulse at the top right there. It is that average pulse profile that is used as an accurate timer. So that the peak of arrival, uh, time of arrival of that peak can be accurately determined. And that is the property that is used to be, um, uh, to use pulses as timers. So traditionally the way that we search for pulses is that we would observe and collect um, time series data across frequency channels. And we collect multiple uh, pulses that lie in here. The problem is that radio pulses are very weak uh, radio sources. And so when we just look at them in the time domain in time in, across a, a channel, it looks like noise. Um, but then we can, First, start by making an, a, a, a range of dispersion measure. And for every dispersion measure or estimated dispersion measure, we um, de-disperse the time series to align them to that estimated dispersion measure. And then we average them across our frequency and time. And then we um, Fourier transform them. And then we save the candidate. And if there, there is a better dispersion measure, we would repeat the process again until we find the best dispersion measure. And at that dispersion measure, that is the best dispersion measure that maximizes the signal to noise ratio. We would now average across frequency and then we will get a pulse at the end. The problem with that is, um, so the, the pulse that is, a, 
that is emitted, um, or the signal that is emitted rather, will propagate through the interstellar medium. It will get, it will experience a dispersive delay. We would average that, um, but we'll, we will determine the dispersion measure, realign and um, sum them up. But there is also an additional factor called interstellar scattering. And this scattering uh, follows uh, or it increases with frequency to minus four. So as you go to the lower frequency, the pulse get broadened out so much that it can actually disperse out the pulse. So as you can see here, we're showing you the average pulse profile across um, frequency bands. And at the lower frequency, you can see that the, the pulsar is basically not there. And without the detection of a pulse, there is no pulsar. We, we, don't, we cannot detect the pulsar. So we now know that looking at low frequency um, for some of the pulsars in the galactic center may not be the best uh, decision because they will literally get scattered out and you might not detect them. And this motivates us to go to a higher frequency to search for pulsars. But then there's also another problem. It's that radio pulses tend to have a very steep spectrum. As you go high in frequency, the radio emission, it gets weaker and weaker. So there needs to be like a sweet spot in between where we can search for these pulsars. Um, so that is why we now look into um, studying uh, at, at, at higher frequencies. But also the scattering does not seem to be um, as large as we thought, because if that was the case and there's a hyper scattering happening in the galactic center, we would not have been able to see the map, the galactic center magnetar, which is the closest one to the um, galactic center black hole. But we're able to see it and that's motivation enough for us to continue the search. And in this case, the search has been for us. In this case, we thought we might have to look into the imaging in the image as uh, the first step towards searching for pulsars. So what we did after seeing this image, which was just after I finished my PhD, my master's, was can we identify uh, point sources? Because a pulsar is in, in the image will just be a point source. Can we identify point sources in the galactic center image that we have that have properties that resembles um, radio pulsars? So then the idea was just to go and look at this image identify as many point sources as we possibly can that are not in the catalog and create a catalog of these objects. And so I make it simple and say my PhD was pretty much just looking at that image or well, first make the, remake the image, determine how many of those sources are new sources, uh, what types are they based on their morphology and spectral properties because we know that's Houses have steep spectra. And then out of those, which ones are actually pulsar candidates based on these properties? And so we went back to the uh, commissioning data for the Meerkat that was um, observed in 2018. Um, this data was uh, part of the Meerkat Galactic Center survey. Um, and it was detected, uh, observed at 1.2 gigahertz. There's about a total of 30 pointings. Um, and I don't know if you might have seen that this data set, K, we produced the image of the galactic center that also showed some giant bubbles in the um, north and the south of Sagittarius A. Um, but our focus was simply on this region along the galactic plane uh, because we are interested in looking for pulsars in along the, the, the plane. So we re-imaged this data. Um, the, the goal was just to produce a high resolution image, not the first image because it included a lot of extended structure and that's not what we're interested in. So we re the, the goal was to re-image and produce high resolution image. 
um, and then also image across the band so we can determine the spectral properties of these sources. And that would have been done by fitting um, the flux with respect to frequency in the log scale and determining that parameter alpha. So with this data, what we did was just pretty much follow the same procedure that's being followed with um, calibrating data from radio telescopes, where you start first by doing some form of a reference calibration, where you have a very bright source whose frequent, um, flux you can model. And then um, in this case, we had that calibrator, the primary calibrator, PKS, B1934, that is modeled by the Reynolds 1994. So it's a well-known, a well-modeled source. And we derived the flux of that source uh, solutions. And then we delayed, uh, derived the delay calibrators, uh, the antenna delays uh, using that same source. And then we also derived what we call the complex gains um, to track any evolution of the local effects um, and then solve that per antenna for an integration time on that primary target. And then we do again the band pass calibration where we determine the frequency response of the telescope. And then after doing that, we apply the solutions to the, um, to the target. And then we follow this, the next step, which is what we call self-calibration is when you start calibrating the target data itself to, to correct. Um, um, you use the target data to improve the data itself. And this is done by, um, um, this will, will minimize the target residuals as much as possible. And then it improves the image um, root mean square and the dynamic range. And to do this, before we did this, there was just two things that we uh, had to keep in mind. It was we had to make uh, the, the sky and the model of the sky as complete as possible. Not that it's it's highly impossible to actually say you could have a very a complete model of the sky, but we would refine it by um, looking into it uh, as accurately as possible. And then we would also have to, we had to take uh, care of the time and frequency um, um, solutions. So the, the antenna, solu the, the, the solutions that we derive in, in, in the frequency and time. Um, so if one gets the wrong um, solution interval, that can also affect the solution of the data. Um, so we did the first calibration by first running a blind deconvolution where we just take the data into a software called WS Keen and a very shallow deconvolution that we run. And then it produces a model of the sky. And then we use that model to now make a mask. And that is the, um, that is the model that the co complete but not very complete model of the sky that we use. And then using that model, we derive the face only gain. And then for every 40, 64 seconds for our data, and then we derive the phase and amplitude corrections. And then we went um, and did a, a UV cut for anything below 300 meters we cut out because we wanted to exclude the um, extended emission, the only thing that we were interested in is the um, uh, the point sources. So in we we excluded that data, um, yeah, that data from the uh, below three hundred meters to exclude extended emission. And then after we get the solutions, we apply them to the target itself, and then we reimaged again, and then went through the process again, um, improving the model as we go. And then we ended up with the first high resolution image of the galactic center. And I'm just going to zoom into it. And you can see now that we have more point sources than we did in the beginning. There's a lot of 
things that are going on in there. And we are also um, in this image, just the crosses are showing the pointing centers. So we had about 30 pointings that we had to process and then uh, mosaic uh, into this multi-frequency um, spectrum image. And then in the process, we also imaged in the, the full meerkat band, the L band, we divided into 16 sub bands. Um, so we imaged each sub band and we used that to uh, determine the spectral indices. So from this image, we first thing that became uh, immediately clear after this was that we were not going to be able to use a radio source finder to find these things. I mean, you can imagine if you're looking into where Sagittarius A is and you're trying to find a point source in that region with a software, that's going to be a very complicated task. And we ran it, uh, we ran a few source finders and we realized that it's only picking up mostly extended sources. On the regions on the outskirts, uh, away from the plane, of course, if you run a source finder, you will find most of these point sources. But if you start going to the plane where there is extended emission, um, the source finder starts struggling. So then the task for me in that case was, was during the pandemic, we were in lockdown. I had nothing else to do. So what I did was to go manually point out point sources in this region. And then we ended up after many years of blood, sweat and tears with 1,523 compact sources um, in the galactic center. And I'm just showing you an example of these point sources. Um, I, I might have to mention here that it was not only point sources that we cataloged because point sources became boring at some point. So I had to entertain myself. Um, so the first group of sources that we have cataloged are point sources, small unresolved um, point like sources. Um, I don't remember exactly what the number was, but the, the this was basically just the width of um, how big the point source is that we would um, catalog it as a compact or classify it as a compact source. And I think the majority of sources we discovered were these type of things. Um, most likely away from the plane, they are most likely just going to be extra galactic sources. But then I'm also just showing you here two known pulsars, two of those five pulsars that we know, we were able to detect point sources in that uh, position of um, the pulsar. Um, and the mean spectral index that we measured for these were about minus 0 0.56, which is just an indicator that majority of these sources are probably extragalactic sources. And then we also, identified these shell-like um, structures. This was mostly because we thought if you were to look at supernova remnants, they would look like um, shell-like structures. Uh, and maybe there might be interesting point sources associated with these um, supernova remnant-like sources. So we've identified 29 of these sources with the spectral index that's minus 0 0.1. Um, this is not typical of the spectral indices of supernova remnants. So maybe these sources are something else. We don't know because we haven't looked at any other um, catalogs at other wavelengths. And then we have 30 um, AGN type sources. Um, with spectral index that's about minus 0 0.8, which is typical of AGN um, sources. Um, and then we also, I also just wanted to mention that I could not say that they are extragalactic without determining their distance, because there is also an AGN type source that we find in the galactic center, which is the Great Annihilator. This is a, a stellar mass black hole at the center um, in the galactic center, and it kind of looks like an AGN in radio emission, but it's actually an, um, a galactic source. So that's just motivation for me to not say that any of these sources are extragalactic without um, any further 
measurements on them. And then we also looked at the uh, point sources that are associated or in the line of sight with uh, filaments. And this, in, this was done because um, there are works that are being done with um, explaining the origin of where the, fi the filaments are. And some theories say that you may have uh, a point source that is, a, so, uh, you have stellar winds that are, I do not understand the theory, but there is stellar winds that um, are responsible or you have past activities of Sagittarius A bringing magnetic fields into uh, the galactic center and there's some stellar winds accelerating particles and forming the filaments. And in that case, you are more likely to find a point source at the tail of uh, the filament. Or if you have um, a pulsar that's injecting electrons, um, relativistic electrons, you may see like a bundle of filaments and a point source in the middle. So I've identified these things without making any uh, theories of what they are and the spectral index of these point sources as well. And then there's also the uh, point sources that are associated with tail like structure. And we found about 17 of these things with the spectral index of minus 0 0.6. And the main reason why we were looking for these type of sources is mostly because of an example of this, uh, the tail of a pulsar wind nebula, the mouse pulsar clearly a tail-like structure point with, 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 with a, not really a point source in this case, but um, associated with a supernova remnant. Unfortunately for me, in this case, there was no um, immediate evident um, supernova shell that is associated with any of these sources. So we just noted them down um, and also, it could likely be that we're just looking at um, parts of an AGN. I'm just giving you an example here of what the M87 looks like at different wavelengths with uh, the VR, VI data. So imagine if we're just looking at one, the one side of an AGN and it looks like it has a tail-like structure to it, but we don't know. So then, um, from this, we decided based on uh, the data that we have, are there any point sources that have tail-like structure that are maybe isolated, uh, that are maybe around a shell-like structure that have steep spectra? And if, if we identify them, are there any sources that are like, that we can say they are most likely to be pulsar candidates and we can search for pulsation in them. And we have identified about 18 candidates based on those uh, structure. However, the problem here is that these sources were most likely just biased only for bright sources with sleep spectra. And this is because, first of all, I have identified these sources by hand. So it was only those sources that I could see. Um, most likely the weaker sources that have been left behind in this catalog. And of course, there is no way to confirm that these um, candidates are pulsars except to just go and search for them in the time domain. That's the only way we can uh, rule them out as candidate or as pulsar candidates, as pulsars. So, the future work now that we're going to do is with uh, the S-band receiver. The Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy has been working with Soreo to install the S-band receivers on Meerkat. Um, we have about 200 hours of time with the S-band focused on just the, the, the Sagittarius A. And we're going to use this time to search for pulsars by collecting data in the image domain, as well as the time domain at the same time. And already we have commissioned the, 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 the receivers. This is the first image uh, from the commissioning data. 
So it's just about one hour um, at S band and some usual suspect is uh, starting to pop up in that image. And also the other thing that we did is we have about 16 hours of time that we are going to use. Um, we have decided to um, use about eight pointings along galactic, the galactic center. And each of those pointings that are indicated by, uh, this is the beam of the Meerkat S band receiver. Um, each of these the green ones are the beam and inside it, they are point sources that we've identified at L band. So the, the blue are the point sources we've identified at L band and we'll be um, the, getting the search, we'll be placing search beams and collecting time search data on, on these as well as imaging at S band as well. And that is what we're currently working on and yeah, stay tuned for the results from there. And then with that, I'm going to leave you with the summary of my talk and I'll take any questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabella, for this wonderful talk. So Rainer, if you want to manage the questions. Ruben. Uh, thank you very much for, for the very nice talk. Um, I wonder, this is very far from my domain, but I just wonder that, that in your classification, you also have like uh, young star objects in the galaxy, right? because you said that there are few extra galactic, but also that some of them could be from the galaxy, from our galaxy. Mm -hmm. Can any of these extended emission be associated with protostellar jets, for example, which is closer to my domain? And I, I have seen some uh, negative uh, Spectral indices, which could be explained by non thermal emission. Could you, could you mention a few? More? And that spectral, the negative spectral indices associated with the extended emission or the point source itself? Both, actually, mm -hmm. because sometimes you don't resolve the jet itself, but you right. can tell that it's some jet emission, non thermal or even thermal, if the spectral indices is uh, appropriate. But I wonder if you had any uh, indication that you may be working with uh, protostellar. Thanks. No, I haven't explored it in that much detail, so I cannot say on that. But it's good to know that there they are such objects. Now, what is your angular resolution up with this new S band image? I mean, like in terms of full width, half maximum of the beam. Um, I don't remember the number of by heart, but I know I think it's a smaller than an S L, L band. Yeah, it yeah. should be smaller. And the high yeah. angular resolution image that you said that you is that the one that was published that's in the, the paper? One okay. Yeah, that's the one we're looking at. It should be around two or seconds. I thought it's five, two. Okay, okay two. Is well, good. Depending on how you produce the image, okay. maybe you can fetch them. Two sounds good. Yeah, but it also depends on what frequency you're using of the S band because it's divided into five sub bands. And for the 200 hour project, we'll be using the, the highest frequency band, sub band. Uh, if there's online questions. Yeah, there's one by Joannis, Mr. Lee. So please open the mic. Yes, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, I have a question. You mentioned that the data were taken in a full polarization mode. So, what is this? Uh, are the, the linear and circular polarization data analyzed, or what is the status of the analysis? Okay, yeah. So the that was the plan, but then at that time, um, calibrating for polarization of Meerkat was not well understood. So we kind of sort of left that behind. But with the S band, we will be um, observing at full polarization as well. So I guess in this case, we'll start getting the polarization information of these things. But at the mm -hmm. moment, we don't have any polarization information of them. Thank you. There is another question by Amidou. Can you open it? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Hi. I uh, hope you can hear me. I understand that you've got uh, more than 1,500 sources and you've, have you, um, uh, maybe I missed it, but have you classified them manually, visually, all of them? Yes. If that is the case, then have you thought of um, using, for example, uh, machine learning techniques to, to help you with that? I mean, I thought about it, but the, I, my, I don't understand, I, well, I don't know much about machine learning, but I believe that you would need to have quite a large sample to train it on. And the majority of resources were just point sources. And the other um, category or classes were just 29, 17. So I don't think you would have enough data to train them, your machine learning classifier for that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this because I don't know how, um, uh, first of all, it's, it sounds like a tedious word. It must be yes. very difficult. And second, I don't know how, what are the parameters that you take into account? Because one that you cited was the um, spectral index. And at some point, you weren't sure whether some of the sources could be classified as um, AGN or galactic sources. Yeah. And so um, in the end, did you just rely on the spectral index or did you take other parameters into account in classifying them? Okay, so apart from, uh, 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 of course, the visual aspect of it. So for the for the classification process, it was just the morphology of the source itself, and then within the the within these classes, we identified the ones that are interesting based on their morphology, the spectral index, and if any of that are resembles pulsar candidates, and that's how we ended up with the eighteen um, sources in the end candidates. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question because I'm very really out of this field. It's okay. Um, when you take your bias for identify these uh, pulsars with your um, spectral indices, uh, from where you get this minus four, 1.8 to power from the literature or some poster that you- Oh, the, 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 the minus 1.8 as- Yes. Okay, so this is the average spectral index of uh -huh. all the known pulses, but that does not mean that all pulses have the spectral index of minus 1.8. And in fact, some pulses have been shown to have um, some form of like a, an invert, inverted spectra. So that's that's also the other bias in this, in that we only looked at the negative spectral sources. So if you maybe move this uh, number, you can uh, you find it. You could less. find some interesting candidates. But I have to say that the only way we can say any of these things are pulsars is to actually go and mm -hmm. search for pulsation in the time domain. Thank you. So with this extension of the program going to S band, where you have high resolution, lower kernel files, mm -hmm. and better quality volume in general, do you have an estimate based on the population of the expected population of how many new pulsars? Uh, may, probably many of them will be complementary because it is also different. Yeah. So from the, those eighteen pulsars, do you expect to increase the number of candidates by as Significant factor, maybe a factor of two, or maybe I haven't I haven't done that calculation yet, but that's just something I need to look into. Yeah. In any case, it's very interesting that you're going to expand this. We have a lot of them. Yeah. Right. We can discuss um, star formation histories yes, later please. on. <laughs> Uh, I, I have a question, just how long, so so if you have a star formation event, it takes 5, 10, 20 million years to, to form the pulsars, depending on the masses. Yes. Um, and then how long do they live approximately until they disappear? So, I mean, what's the visibility of a pulsar? For, this is like 10 million years. Five million years. That's actually a number I do not know. 
But I know that maybe this is not an answer to your question, but I know that um, for the first rotating millisecond pulsars, um, majority of them are most likely going to be recycled. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so perhaps maybe not from the new pulses that are formed from supernova explosion. Okay. So so you are you more interested in, in the, the millisecond pulsars? Yes, because they are accurate timers. They're very stable and okay. they are the ones that we can use for fundamental physics. Okay. to study the black holes and black hole properties and okay. so they, gravities, you need okay. the millisecond pulsars. Because right. the young ones tend to be very unstable. And, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other question? I would like to point out that Isabella is here for the entire week. She is hosted by our Galactic Center group. She's actually over at the our extension at what we call the IAB, <laughs> the, 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 the old uh, health center. And yeah, she would be really happy, I guess, to yeah, discuss with you. Uh, we will talk about star formation histories. And uh, I mean, we have the, the SKA group here. We have the Event Horizon Telescope group here. So lots of radio astronomy. Thank you very much. Thank you.